Okay, it seems like most of the clicks have slowed down. So welcome everyone and happy holidays. Um, welcome to our last um, monthly call webinar of the year. Um, look forward to working with you guys, seeing everybody next year as well. Um, so we're gonna go ahead and get started. I hope everyone can see my screen. Um, but I just wanted to remind everybody that um, these calls are recorded. Um, this is, it's an open discussion, so feel free to unmute yourself um, to ask a question or engage in the discussion. But if, if there's a speaker, please um, um, mute yourself to, you know, not have outside noise. And these calls will also be recorded and um, posted on the MBS Tehran YouTube channel. So I just wanted to start with our standing agenda. First, we'll welcome. We have a few new team members that I want to introduce you to that join the NBS CRN team. I'm going to start off with Carolyn Lumpkins. Carolyn, you want to go ahead and um, introduce yourself? Sure. Thanks, Jennifer. Um, hi, everyone. My name is Caroline Lumpkins. And um, as mentioned, I recently joined the NBS TRN team as the LC Research Associate. Um, in my role, I'll be working with the bioethics and legal work group uh, to help develop resources and provide guidance about the various uh, ethical, legal, and social issues um, related to newborn screening. Uh, just a brief background, I received my master's in bioethics from Johns Hopkins, um, and then prior to joining the NBS TRN team, I worked at a rare disease patient advocacy nonprofit, so um, I'm excited to be here and, and glad I could join the call today. Thanks. Thanks, Caroline. And I also want to introduce um, a person that has been also been working at ACMG for a while, but just joined our team, um, LaStephanie Barnes. LaStephanie, did you want to say a few words? Uh, hi, everyone. Um, I'm LaStephanie Barnes. Um, I have been with ACMG since January 2020. Um, I joined the MBS CRN team in September of 2020, and now I've kind of transitioned completely over to support the MBS TRN team, and I'm excited about being here. Thanks, Stephanie. Um, at this time, we want to ask to see if there's any other new folks that are, have been joining the call, and if they want to introduce yourself, feel free to in, unmute yourself. So with that silence, I'll take that everybody's um, old timers here. So um, we'll continue on with our standing agenda. So I know there are several folks from the New York team that are on the call. So um, whoever wants to get the update for December, go ahead. Hi, it's Joe. I'm gonna be providing the update today. Um, hope everybody's doing well. So first we'll give an update on ALD. Um, some of these numbers are going to sound the same, like when they're big numbers screened, they don't really change a lot from month to month, but we've screened about 1.9 million ALD um, or babies for ALD. We've had 135 referrals, um, that's in a, with one additional one since the last call. There were uh, 68 boys referred and 67 girls referred. Um, out of those boys, 52 had ABCD1 variants, and out of the 67 girls, there were 50, 50 with ABCD1 variants. Of those kind of in the feedback loop for follow-up, we have 41 that are considered diagnosed with XALD, and 15 are Zelliger or other type peroxisomal sores disorders. I would add that of those 41 diagnosed, I always like to put quotes around those. Close evaluation is really needed to know that number. I think the number could either be bigger or smaller, depending on how we look at the variants, um, how clinicians report them back to us um, always need to be evaluated. And we haven't, we haven't done a thorough job of that at this point on all of those. For Pompeii disease, we've, have 1.65 million screened. No new referrals since last time, so we're at 194 still. 
all the rest of the numbers um, I think have remained unchanged. 10 with infantile onset. There are 105 with possible late onset Pompeii disease. And thus far, are, these are asymptomatic cases. And then our, um, we detected carriers, 79 such cases. For MPS1, we're at 682,000 infants screened. We've had 35 referrals, two of which are new since the last call, and still no confirmed MPS uh, clinically detect affected cases to date. We have five possible late onset cases with where there were two variants identified. And the remainder were likely carriers with uh, just one variant detected. For GAMPT deficiency, we've screened about the same number, yes, yeah, 682,000. 24 have been referred. This is a correction from last time. We had uh, 25, but one of those was for an outside uh, confirmation test, I believe, and not detected through screening. So should be 24 referred. There's um, the remaining one true positive that we've reported on in the past as well. For spinal muscular atrophy, same number, 682,000 or so screened, 36 referrals, two new ones since the last call. And then we, some of these numbers are going to be repeats, one with one copy of SMN2, 19 with two copies, which that number is up by plus one since um, the last our last call, 11 with three copies, three with four copies of SMN2, and there's an additional one in that from the last call, and uh, two with five copies of SMN2. As far as Duchenne, we, I think, you know, our last update will likely be, I don't know if we'll have anything new to add to that, but we have stopped uh, adding babies to that screen, so it kind of remains unchanged since the last time. If you need those numbers, I can pass that all along as well. I think, yeah, last time we, you know, last month, we got the numbers. You ended in September, and there was 33, over 33,042 referrals for infants with DMD and, or Becker syndrome. I think that is, if that's correct. Yeah, that's what, that's what I've got. Okay. I saw, um, oh, go ahead, Amy. Oh, I was going to say, uh, Joe, can you remind us of your guys' SMA algorithm or do SMA plus skid and then, then you do copy number or how do you guys do it? Um, I'm hoping either Michelle or Colleen can chime in. I always uh, have to ask. And one of these days I'll commit it to my memory. <laughs> So for SMA, we do a multiplex to start. And then if we have a failure, we break out the SMN1, um, do that separate. If that shows, if the RNSQ passes and the SMN1 fails, then we do the um, SMN2 copy number. You can correct me if I'm wrong, Colleen. And Michelle, since I got you on, on the line as well, I know um, it's, I think all the other programs announced that what they got you guys um, that received the next round of the IDIQ contract. And I believe New York is also one of the awardees um, and, and one of the awardees for that contract. Is that correct? Yes. Mm -hmm. We couldn't um, bid on the contracts because we're already doing the NPS2 screening as part of Screen Plus. 
Okay, so you have the contract, but not doing the MPS2 task order. Correct. Okay. Do we have any other additional, any other questions for the New York team group? Well, thanks again. And um, thanks again, Joe and Michelle for your update. We'll move on to the North Carolina team. Um, I know I got a message from Kate saying she was unavailable, but I think I believe I saw Cindy on the line and Melissa on the line. So I was um, wondering if you guys would be able to provide the update in lieu. Yes, it's Melissa. Um, I can give a little bit of an update. Um, so unfortunately, but I don't have updated numbers for a DMD pilot. We do our numbers right at the beginning of the month, <laughs> it's the second, so we haven't quite finished them. So the numbers that I have are still the 7428 for the DMD pilot. So we should get new numbers here in the next day or two. Um, but I can give a quick update just on the MPS2 um, task order. Um, we obviously haven't started screening. <laughs> we just got awarded the task order at the end of September. Um, I can just give you kind of a couple of general updates about kind of the prep work and the timeline. Um, so we are um, planning to hopefully start screening in April um, of next year. Um, we're doing obviously a lot of legwork right now to um, work on the prep for that. Um, so Kate uh, is taking the lead on um, working with Perk and Elmer to get all of the equipment that we need and reagents and everything in-house. Um, the screening will take place at RTI. I think I might've mentioned that last time. Um, we are working with Duke um, on the validation plan. So um, that will be underway hopefully here, um, probably not, not in December. We gotta get equipment in-house first, but hopefully in January. Um, we're also working on a few other things like the IRB. I think uh, there's a note there about the screen for 140,000 infants. Um, and I may have mentioned last time that um, we're seeking a waiver of informed consent. So we're working on that application right now. Um, and we've been working with UNC who is also the um, subcontractors that are our partners on um, the follow-up on um, getting the protocol in place, the short-term follow-up protocol. So, so lots of legwork, um, kind of prep work going on right now. Um, so we can kind of keep you all posted on things. And I'm not sure if anybody from the state is on the line that can provide an update as far as how SMA screening is going. I know that they launched in May, and I think we got a, a brief update last time from someone from the state. I don't know if anybody is um, from the state either, but we, we at RTI worked with on um, the state um, to help them transition, you know, from RTI screening for SMA to the state. And then we also had some, we still currently had some funding from the CDC to help support the state in that endeavor. Um, and as you noted, Jennifer, they started screening in May. Um, my um, understanding is that it's still only the five babies that have been identified, um, no new babies in the last month. Um, the um, you know, follow-up is going well. I think I do see Cindy on. I don't know if there's anything additional that um, anybody from UNC, I think Kristen Quinard was on too, wants to share, but um, all five babies have been started on treatment. Um, they're kind of at very place, various places across the state, although I think a couple are going to Wake Forest for treatment. Um, but yeah, Cindy or, or Kristen, feel free to add anything. Yeah, I don't know of any updates. Sounds right. I think we've seen one at UNC and I think the rest have been um, seen at uh, Wake Forest University. And we've you know, been looking at sort of the time to the sample arriving in the lab until the patient actually starts on treatment and sort of some of the, um, you know, delays in, in getting either um, intrathecal treatment or gene therapy started. But it's 
typically been within, you know, the first month of life. So things are going well. And Cindy, do you know if they, is um, SMA set up where there's certain specific sites that patients are going to kind of? Yes. Okay. So it's the same. Okay. Yeah. There's, currently um, three sites in North Carolina and one site in um, Virginia at King's Daughters where some of our uh, Northeastern North Carolina patients are seen there. I don't think any have actually gone there yet, but they're, they're set up to take those patients because Virginia, to my knowledge, has not started SMA screening yet. Okay, sounds good. Any other questions for the North Carolina team? Uh, Jennifer, this is Bob Vogt. Um, I have a general question about SMA and the um, follow-up with respect to treatment. And uh, it involves the, uh, has there been any difficulty with getting uh, sufficient coverage for the, the uh, treatments, either the uh, intrathecal or the, the gene therapy? And I noticed in New York, there was one uh, report of um, one patient that had one screen positive that had five copies of SMM2. And I'm particularly curious to know if that prompted any discussion with the uh, insurance company or whoever would be funding the treatment about treating that baby. So if anyone has any information about that, I'd, I'd love to hear it. Uh, again, Carolina, I, oh, go ahead. I, was just, I don't know if Cindy wants to comment on this, but um, I think to, from conversations that I've heard, I don't think we've had any difficulties in getting babies um, approved for treatment, but I don't know, Cindy, if you've... Yeah, no, I, I was going to say the same thing, Melissa. Okay. To my knowledge, we've had no, no problems. I mean, it takes quite a lot of paperwork, but it gets done fairly quickly and they get started. And I think, Bob, one of the things we're hoping to do when we had um, Mary Schroth from Cure SMA present as part of this call a few months ago was sort of Cure SMA has an effort where they're trying to connect to families um, to help with some of that, you know, logistics of long-term follow-up. So we're hoping to learn more from, you know, uh, families that sign up for the registry or that are followed through Cure SMA. So that might be a good place for us to connect to to see if they can help answer some of your questions too. Yeah, I'm not sure. If, oh, sorry, Bob. I was just going to say, I'm, I'm not sure. Maybe if um, New York wanted to comment on it or further too, because it sounded like there was more difficulty um, earlier when, when it was first added and states first started, and it might have settled down a little bit more. But if other people have comments on that can comment on that, that would be great too. I think anecdotally early on, there were a couple of cases where they were waiting for insurance in New York. Um, the five copy, I'm not really sure how that, we don't, we don't get a lot of that feedback. And I think that family, I believe they were out of state for treatment. So I'm not really sure, you know, what, how they ended up getting it. Um, I don't know if Colleen has any details on that. I was sort of not um, expected, I guess. I will say I just pulled up the notes from the five SMA cases. Um, that we had from the state and three of the babies, three of the five babies had three copies of SMN2 and all three are on Zolgensima. And two, the other two babies had two copies of SMN2 and are both on Spinraza. Um, this is Kristen. In regards to the coverage, um, I do know that we had one baby who had active um, North Carolina Medicaid, and I don't know all the specifics um, as our neurologist did a lot of the legwork for this, but I do know that that did require white bagging of the drug um, by a specialty pharmacy. I don't know um, all the ins and outs of that, but we did have to get a, spe a special approval um, from a committee um, 
at our group at, at our hospital. So I, I don't know if that factors into anything for anyone or not, but. Could, could you uh, uh, describe the term? What do you, was it white bagging was the. Yeah, so I don't, this is where all the insurance and getting approvals kind of goes over my head, but from the notes from our neurologist and our team, um, it looks like it does require white bagging of the drug to be procured from a specialty pharmacy and then administered in an outpatient hospital encounter, not inpatient. And I, I don't have all the specifics, but apparently they were able to work directly, I think, with the uh, drug company for that. So I'd have to look into that a bit more, but um, that was the only other notes I had in regards to our Medicaid patient. I see in the chat window that Jillian um, from Nebraska said that Cure SMA help resolve some of those issues. I don't know, Jillian, if you're able to unmute yourself or in a place where you could tell us a little bit about that. Yeah, so um, we had two cases, our first two SMA cases, I think were born 13 days apart, um, unfortunately. So for us, that was, um, and they had both had uh, one was, so they both had, um, one was Nebraska Medicaid um, and the other one was a private payer, but they both, uh, the private payer and the Nebraska Medicaid were both basically branches of the same um, commercial insurance um, and ultimately had the same limitations. Um, one of the babies needed to have bridging um, coverage. So with the Spinraza, which was covered, thankfully, um, so Nebraska Medicaid it ultimately ended up being much more um, flexible, but uh, the other infants took quite a long time uh, to get coverage. Uh, so 55 days, I believe it was, until we got that baby infused with Solgensma. So very, very frustrating process um, with lots of people involved. Um, that baby did eventually um, get the medication that was from the neurologist's work and the family's work. Um, but now the, the payer is now change their policy. So the next infant that is identified by a screening will not have the same uh, troubles, but that Cure SMA did reach out to the payer. And we also had the neurologist working on it and you know some other efforts, but it's very difficult um, from the screening perspective that we cannot reach out to the insurance company directly and that sort of thing. Um, so it was very difficult, but yeah. <laughs> and we thankfully have not had another baby why that was being resolved, so. Wow, thanks for that story. Yeah, no problem. So hopefully um, we thought that was all resolved. We'd worked with Medicaid before um, the screen was put into place, but we were not aware that, you know, this large payer was going to be such a problem. It would have been nice if they had spoken up or we knew this was gonna be a problem and we were gonna have a baby wave that long. So thankfully no, um, you know, was asymptomatic right or treatment. So thank you. And Jillian, when did when, how when did you guys start screening? You said this happened in the beginning. Uh, well, so we are a very small birth state, so it's about twenty four and a half thousand last year. We're looking at twenty five thousand this year. Uh, we started screening in November of two thousand twenty, and so this happened in July. Okay, All right. and so we had the two 13 days apart, and now we've had a third case that was diagnosed prenatally. So. Yeah, it'll be interesting to see if. Um, um, from the states, as as far as SMA, are are you seeing these prenatal cases diagnosed coming in too? Like, are you hearing that um, being reported when when you are start, when you're screening when those specimens come in? Does anybody have any experience of that? Other other states have an experience where they're hearing that there's some prenatals coming in with SMA in particular. Okay, well, is there any other questions for the North Carolina team? If not, I will move on to Georgia. Now I've got contact that um, Angela or and um, Bill will not be on the call today. Oh, I just see um, Carrie has a note that they uh, California has some prenatal diagnosis as well. So they're seeing that coming into the lab. Thanks for that information. 
Um, Trisha, I don't want to put you on the spot. You can always say no, but if you want to report out some of those numbers, we can call on you. I don't have any of those numbers, so uh, okay. yeah. No <laughs> we'll get we them. don't have any new Pompeii MPS1 or Crabbe that I can tell you. Okay, that's 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 good information. No, no new Pompeii. So still same numbers as, as previously reported. Okay. Um, thanks. And I don't think we also have anybody from um, Wisconsin on the call too. Is that correct? Iowa just wrote in the chat, Kimberly wrote in the chat as well. Iowa had um, ID to baby through newborn screening and discovered it was a prenatal diagnosis as well. So we're definitely seeing that's a common thing with um, uh, um, SMA. But since if um, Kimberly or Carrie want to mute themselves and give some updates from their states, we would greatly appreciate that from this call. Or any other state want to give it update? Can I get any takers? Um, <laughs> you know, Jennifer, before you go to updates from stakeholders too, I was wondering, I know you sent out a message to the chat or to the listserv about states that are conducting pilots and was just wondering if anybody has any update on whether they're doing pilots or planning pilots or we're sort of trying to, you know, make a list of what might be coming um, that states are thinking about doing. Yeah, I got a few responses in, in my email from a few states, that, you know, starting screening for different conditions or piloting them. But if anybody else has any um, updates, um, please let me know. You can also sit, um, put the message in the chat box if you don't want to unmute yourself as well. Uh, we can still capture that data there. Okay, I'm going to go ahead and move on to the updates from our other partners. Oh, I uh, got an update, got a taker. Um, Greg, he put Colorado has is using BabySeek and is beginning a pilot for MPS1 in Pompeii. Great, great news. So is that a, um, and it's, it looks like they're just a pilot, so it hasn't started on everyday screening yet. And then Kimberly also says, nothing new for Iowa, conducting a pre-implementation assessment for Pompeii and MPS. One and other LSDs to see what it would take for Iowa to screen for these. So, I was um, going to be up and as might be up and running soon for the other LSDs. And then Melissa um, said, and, and yes, so. Um, so, um, is Kishi on the um, call? Do you yeah. want to give an update from APHL? Um, sure. Um, so we have um, one meeting and two webinars coming up this month. Um, so starting with the webinars, um, we have a webinar on OTC um, that is scheduled for Thursday, December 9th at 2 p.m. Um, we did send out um, information regarding registration for that meeting um, through Collaborate. So please feel free to, to register for that. Um, we also have a hot topic webinar coming up on newborn screening contingency planning. Um, that's going to take place on December the 16th um, at 1 p.m. And then coming up uh, on Tuesday of next week, we have the final session of our 2021 Continuous Quality Improvement National Meeting. Um, so we've sent out information regarding this as well. Um, please feel free to register for that. It is free and it's open to um, the public. It's open to everyone. Um, I think Chanel is on the call. I don't know if she wanted to say anything else about the CQI meeting. Okay, um, so, so maybe not. Okay. <laughs> 
<laughs> so maybe not. So that's that's it. Um, so again, please feel free to register for any of the meetings or webinars. Thanks. Thank you, Kashia. There's a few other comments in the chat I just wanted to read out. So um, Greg from Colorado says they're still having issues with the Q site from Perkin Elmer for um, XALD validation. Does any other state have any comments about um, using the Q site from Perkin Elmer trans or transitioning to the um, Q site? So we have Q sites, we use them for our Neo LSD. Um, just before we go live, they had to kind of pull the guts out of one of ours because it died for lack of a better term. Um, but other than that, since we've gone live, we've had no major issues with them, but we have three. Can I, this is Joe, can I have clarification? Are you having trouble in Colorado getting a Q site or you're having issues with the ones that are already there implementing XALD? We're having problems getting them. Okay. They started delivering them in April and I still don't have complete units. Gotcha. So, so I have- yeah, We've had some pieces get pulled from other places and I think we've had our pieces get pulled to other places. So I, that doesn't necessarily surprise me. Yeah, we were supposed to start validating in May. They said they would have them optimized in May, and we still don't have them optimized or um, completely in. Um, so they're they're not even. Uh, we don't have two functional units yet. Thanks, Greg. It's Melissa. I will. I do know that North Carolina is now using Q sites to replace their aging mass spec equipment, and they ordered six from Perkin Elmer, and I think they've gotten three in the last mm, month to two months, I'd say. Um, so I haven't heard of any problems, but I can ask him really late. I wonder if this is a, you know, same thing with other appliances and the supply chain issue that's going around the country. Kimberly, I think she also had another comment. And, or no, Karen had a comment. Oh, uh, Karen asked, and I don't know if the New York team can comment on this or not, but she, um, I think you, you, you said that there was a child that had five copies of SMN2, but I don't know if you did, it, it was ever discussed the treatment for this child. Is this child receiving treatment and is it Spinraza or Zolgensma? I know we talked about the insurance challenges, but I'm not sure if we stated the actual treatment. We, uh, one of the kids that had five copies ended up getting gene therapy and we don't, I mean, that was the family's decision, I guess. Mm -hmm. Thanks, Michelle. Um, if there's no other comments, um, I just wanted to remind people very quickly, last meeting we did discuss some topics. So we're in the process of trying to revamp these um, monthly calls um, for next year, for 2022. I know we talked a lot about the IDIQ um, um, conditions and some pilots and the pilot studies by states. Um, we're rethinking ways where we can capture that data on this call so it um, could be more useful. Um, so we're working through that process now. We're also, we also talked about outstanding questions for some of the newer conditions. We talked about short-term and long-term follow-up challenges and maybe discussing that more um, on, on another call, as well as uh, we'd like to get some feedback if states would be um, able maybe to share their screening algorithms. Um, another thing that we have been talking about a lot on these calls that seems to be coming up more frequently is sequencing and sequencing through newborn screening versus the diagnostic lab. It's seeing like it's being more used as a um, second tier, third tier informational testing um, that's been done that's been done in the newborn screening, but 
there's other conditions that may be coming down the pipeline for sequencing. So um, that would be sequencing only. So having more discussions about that. Um, I also wanted to see if there was any interest or maybe new technologies that we wanted to discuss in these calls or maybe conditions, looking forward to conditions that might be coming to newborn, newborn screening that, um, that have been just started having discussions about. Um, we talked about implementing implementations of the newer conditions, MPS2, GAMPT, CRABA is coming down the pipeline, so maybe having diving deeper into those three conditions, or maybe even teaming with AP, APHL to have some of these discussions. We also talked about um, the biobank issues, particularly the legal issues in um, Michigan with the biobank case and having a pre presentation for that. But, and lastly, discussions about just the definition of what a pilot study is. We're talking about pilot studies. Most of the ones that we talked about in this call seem to be ones that have been nominated or recently nominated or have added to the rest and states are starting to screen for them. But um, there's also ones that when your state is adopting them, maybe there's a pilot that they wanna do as well, or um, more of a research basis where it's, you know, to try to gain some evidence for a, you know, a rest nomination or a state panel nom nomination. So we could have discussions about that as well. So I just wanted to check in to see if there was other things that were on people's mind that they would like to discuss. Is there technologies that would be of interest that we can put on the calendar for next year? Are there condition, other conditions that we, we think that we should dive deeper into as well? We can even dive deeper into a particular piece in the newborn screening, such as long-term follow-up as well, and just wanting to gauge people's interest in having those discussions on, on this call. Um, not to speak for Bob, Vote, and CDC, but I think understanding what CDC is working on for um, QCQA panels, like the DMV would be helpful, I think. Bob, I don't know if you can comment on that or if you could just bring that back to the CDC group for us, that would be helpful. Yeah, um, well, with that particular one thing, I do know something about, um, we had um, a poster at last year's APHL and then, or the most recent APHL and another poster at the recent ISNS meeting, at European meeting that um, uh, depicted the results from uh, a, uh, uh, a, a uh, review of multi-lab review of quality control materials that we've been making actually now for a few years. Um, one of our folks, uh, Elizabeth Hall, started working on this two or three years ago. And um, since then, Paul D'Antonio and, and uh, myself and others have continued with it. So that we have, um, we know that we can make good QC materials. We know that they work operationally in, um, functioning newborn screening settings because our colleagues in New York and then more recently our colleagues at, at RTI, um, as they are doing real screening, have been using these materials and feeding the results back to us. So the most recent depiction of those results was the ISNS meeting in Europe. Um, and we are moving that into a manuscript and hope to get it out, um, get it into clearance before the end of the year take that information that's on the poster and get it published. So we feel like we should be in pretty good, uh, a pretty good position for support with respect to QC materials uh, in, uh, in DMD screening. Um, the, the genetic aspects um, uh, that, that would be perhaps involved or would be involved in follow-up are uh, not included in my the comments I just made. And I, I don't know exactly where that stands. I think it's it's um, something of a challenge to um, uh, determine how that would be done. We did it, uh, and I think it's still being done with LSD. We were able to get cell lines spiked into uh, blank matrix that, um, uh, and then get the enzyme level adjusted so that 
they would be screen positive, and then they would stand up under follow-up genetic um, analysis. Uh, but that that's um, that presents all kinds of, of, of challenges, and in particular, getting uh, uh, cell culture harvests large enough to make large-scale batches of materials. Um, so I think we can handle those things in when they're in the pilot phase, and um, uh, that. But but I don't know how that's coming along, even with SMA, for um, for uh, quality control materials. Thanks, Bob, for the update on that. And um, yeah, maybe we have some more discussion about you know what's coming down the, the pike as far as um, CDC, QC, and reference material, even maybe material that you said you're piloting um, or... Um, yeah, I'll talk with um, Suzanne Cordovado, who I think most of you all know her well, and uh, tell her that this came up in discussions and perhaps she can join for a meeting in the near future, or at least convey to me um, what they're doing in her group, the uh, molecular biology group. But I know that the, the challenge of getting enough cells uh, out of culture lines that would um, be useful for genetic, uh, for, for, for DNA analysis sequencing um, is, um, is a real challenge for, for, for everyone. Yeah, thanks again, Bob. There's a few other comments in the chat box and I kind of add them to the list of things. Joe, go ahead, you can feel free to unmute yourself and comment on your comment about um, receiving treatment for the CALD or, if, yeah, or anything else to say. Yeah, I actually think it would be, I mean, some, some places may have been screening long enough, although I'm not, you know, it'd be interesting to know what these cases that where people are developing disease and being able to trace back to kind of the newborn screen results. Um, that would be, I would feel that way about possible late onset Pompeii cases or NPS cases, anything where people have seen these have developed in, you know, to a point where they've required treatment or are getting treatment. I don't know if it's too early yet with most of us or most people on this call or not, but. Yeah, it sounds like we're coming on the cusp because they're both, I think they both were nominated in 20, or they were added 20, 2015. I know Pompeii and I think ALD was the year after, if I'm correct. I could be wrong on those dates, but um, yeah. yeah. ALD was earlier than Pompeii. Um, uh was for us anyway, <laughs> maybe not on the- um, Yeah, on the, on the rust, yeah. You, I know you guys started screening for ALD earlier, um, but I think the a rust, it was at least we're right. getting- on. Yeah, it went the other way, that's mm -hmm. right. So yeah. yeah, I just think it's, you know, we've seen, every, we've detected a fair number of possible late onset Pompeii cases. And to my knowledge, we haven't, had any of them develop disease and get treatment yet. There were some that were non-classical Pompeii cases, um, you know, where where they may be on treatment. I, there may be two of those, but that's been, that might be old news for us, but it's, there's certainly not a lot of them coming down with, you know, that re are requiring treatment yet. And kind of wondering the same about ALD. You know, we have a so fair number of patients that, we're on the lower end of our kind of cutoff, have ABCD1 variants that sometimes with boosts, and, you know, they do end up with elevated um, very long chain fatty acids when they're tested and called ALD cases sometimes, but, you know, the clock is still ticking and thankfully no, they're not developing, but, you know, disease, but certainly want to know about those. This is Tricia. None of ours would be really old enough to be concerning, but if we're doing that, I'd also add the, um, so one of our concerns was keeping track on the, of these kids who appear fine. So kind of the adherence to, if you're not concerned about something happening until they're five, are they 
following up on everything in the interim. Um, and I don't, we don't have great data on that because our, we started screening for ALD relatively recently, but I do know it was a bit of an issue with some of the kids identified in our pilot study for ALD and Pompeii, where they just, you know, trying to be reassuring and telling them for, you know, the, uh, and possibly not appreciating that, yeah, you do still need to come back for your MR, MRIs. And are we able to make sure that they are? And that also kind of comes with them not all being followed in genetics for everything, which is, you know, you're reaching out to your different specialties then as well. So um, I think that would be interesting to see, particularly as we kind of get into more late onset cases where they're going to have this kind of Uh, I don't want to call it a grace period, but it's analogous to a grace period where everything seems fine. And does that cause problems in keeping track of everybody? Yeah, that's those are great points. And um, with the ALD cases, you might, um, you, I'm guessing, you, Joe, you are seeing the adrenal insufficiencies and they, they might be treated for that, even though they're not treated for the, the, the other issues that may come arise, that might arise. Yeah, we have some that are have been treated for adrenal um, issues or insufficiency, but we also have some that have been have been, uh, gone on for either the transplant or other, you know, the, the genetic treatment. And then Kimberly also put another comment in the chat that we might want to, you know, visit as well on these calls as far as the Every Life Foundation and um, they're going state by state and getting alignment with the rest. So that state will screen or commit to screening to keeping up with what is a core condition, I guess, on the rest. Um, Kimberly, is that my, is that correct? Is my understanding correct about that? Because I know that there was a letter, there was a letter that went out that Maryland just passed something legislative that they would keep up with the rest. Yeah, that's that's what, sorry, that's what they're trying to do. Yeah. So Ohio, California, um, Georgia, and um, Florida <laughs> currently have that legislation. And then um, now they're targeting Iowa, Maryland, and Massachusetts. So the Georgia one isn't automatic addition. It's automatic nomination to our state panel. It's not uh, if it's on the rust, we have to screen. It's if it's on the rust, it has to be considered by our state panel. Gotcha. Does, and, it, does it give them Patricia a timeline to consider it or any? It does, but it. I thought it I think the last, it seemed fairly generous, which basically meant it aligned with what we were already doing for most rust conditions. So, um, and then it was an implementation timeline of 18 months after funding had been appropriated, I believe. I'm not 100% sure on the specifics, but uh, when it passed, it was like, okay, that's fine. So uh, it didn't seem like it would be problematic. And Cindy, do you want to comment? Because I think it was just legislation was just passed in North Carolina. About Correct. This. Yeah, just passed last month um, that within three years of a condition being added to the rust, North Carolina has to start newborn screening for it. Oh, you, it's automatically added. So there's there's no discussion or no, they just they, they have to do it. Correct? That's my under, That's my understanding. Yeah, within three years. And they have to, the state lab has to submit a report 18 months after it's been added to the RUSP, I guess, for, you know, planning purposes. And then if three years goes by and they haven't yet added it, they have to submit reports every six months as to why it hasn't been added. Mm, I see. Are the states, are you guys seeing, if you've looked across the states, are they all using the same language? like on the every life side no I've, I've been doing this in preparation for this <laughs> bill um, potentially being introduced in iowa so i have i'm looking now at a spreadsheet of all the other states and and what the language says um yeah i mean there's there's some common 
um, language, but it really varies. You know, like Patricia said, for Georgia, um, it's not required that they'll screen for the conditions on the RUSP. Um, and then the timelines that state have states have varies as well, and how those um, additions to the screening panel would be funded um, is different. Kim, so you said you gathered all this information already. I'm looking at a lot of it right now. Yeah. Can you share it with us? Um, it's not really in. I mean, it's just. I have a Word document and I copy and pasted from everybody's legislation and then just highlighted stuff. So it really is a working mess <laughs> right now. Um, once I once I get something put together, I'll that looks a little nicer, I'll be happy to send it out. Um, right. I'll just send it good. through through you guys. Yeah. Yeah, maybe we should uh, maybe we could consider collecting some information for the the legislation that has passed on how they are adopting it in their state, like how how long does it have, how long do they have, and is it an automatic, like they definitely have to do it, or in Georgia's case where they have to consider it, so it might be interesting to collect more information about that on our side as well. Maybe a good addition to our policy map, Jennifer. Yeah, exactly, yep. Mm -hmm. you that. Talk to Dr. Chan on our team. <laughs> <laughs> Um, uh, so I, is there any, if, if there's no other, we're getting close to the end. I just have one more announcement that we've talked about last time, but just bringing it up again, that if you are able to um, register for the ACMG annual meeting, which is ha happening in March this year, end of March, um, there's an early bird deadline where you can get some savings for registering and NBSRN is hosting a CME course titled Exploring the Role of Medical Genetics and Genomics in Advancing Newborn Screening. So if you're able to attend that session, we would be happy um, to have you. And, in, and the, the meeting is also in person as well as virtual. So you have both options. Um, if you haven't already, please register on our website at nbstrn.org. You can just sign up. There's multiple spots on the page where you're, you can sign up. We would like to have at least one state representative from each state or, or um, territory district in the U.S. I think we're up to 44 newborn screening programs so far, um, but we would like to have 100% um, registered. And then finally, if you have anything else for us, please get, contact us. Um, we are going to take a break from our January from the January meeting and then reconvene in February as well. And I think that's it. I know there's a, some live act of chat going on in the chat box about the um, the legislative changes. But if I if there's nothing else. Um, we can, uh, Amy, do you have any other things that you would like to comment on? No, I think that's really helpful. I think we could think about um, now, thanks for making us aware of all the legislative activities, but maybe that's somewhere we can help jump in and format something that would be helpful for everybody. All right, well, thanks again, everyone for joining this at the end of the year and we'll see you have a happy new year and we guys, we'll see you next year for the call.